Today, I'm going to go back over 52 years to a Thursday evening, the 2nd of February, 1967. Michael was at the tender age of 16, nearly 17. Two months time, I would be 17. And uh, we got this venue to appear at the Imperial Hotel in Darlington at the Blue Pad Club. Some people call it the R&B Club, but it was officially known as the Blue Pad Club. And uh, we were going to play alongside a band that had come up from London. They hadn't done many gigs outside of London. They'd done a few inside. They were fairly new. I think they'd only been together since the October uh, of the previous year. And uh, they were currently, at the time, number six in the charts. And the management, the, uh, the booking agent, didn't want them to, to do it. And they actually offered the promoter £300, which was a bloody lot of money in them days, to... Uh, not turn up to cancel the gig but the uh, the manager the guy who found this guy uh, he said no he wanted the band to do it and uh, so they couldn't get out of it and the fee was 75 pound so a lot different to 300 but anyway the band was the Jimi Hendrix experience. Well, didn't he go on to greater things? But anyway, let's go back to this night. Um, when we arrived at the uh, the place, the venue, uh, we weren't allocated a dressing room like uh, uh, Jimi Hendrix had been, which was up on the top floor, and I think on the servants' quarters. But anyway, bloody long way up. And we were allocated the pump room, which was next to the uh, the venue, the dance surf floor. It wasn't really a proper stage, it was more like a platform. Now, over the years, this story, over 52 years, has bloody altered from time to time. Some sad bloody people looking for a bloody limelight by the sounds of it have altered the true facts. Well, I was there, I played there, I personally spoke to the band in question, and so these are my facts. And if you don't want to believe it, that's your problem, not mine. So anyway, we set the gear up, but the main band were there, and uh, They'd set up, done a bit of a sound check, and they'd been in the North East the previous night, on the Wednesday night. They'd played the new Cellar Club in South Shields, which I later went on to play with various bands. And it had a revolving stage. And normally, within a couple of minutes of the stage coming round with you on it, if they didn't like you, which in most cases they didn't, there was a lot of beer bottles thrown on the stage. So the turntable had a lot of use, let's put it that way. But anyway, back to the, this venue. So we plonked our gear on the stage where we could. The, uh, the band, the roadies for the Hendrix band, asked me to save space could I use Mitch Mitchell's kit because of the uh, the space on the stage? Our amps were fine, like we weren't into very big stuff in them days, Vox AC-30s, but, but the first time we came across a Marshall stack, 
which Jimmy had and Noel had. And so we proceeded after we put the gear uh, on the stage, what we needed and what we put back in our little uh, ex post office van outside and uh, went into the pump room where as we went in, I recognised this uh, guy having a bit of a set to with Jimmy. Jimmy was a bit concerned about what the reaction was going to be because this venue, the Blue Pad Club, had a little bit of a, shall we say, modish feel about it, the days of the mods. And he wasn't too sure how he was going to go down. But his manager, Chas Chandler from The Animals, he had assured him it'd be all right like it was the night before. But the night before, the Cellar Club was a mixed audience. It wasn't all bloody uh, mods. But anyway, they then disappeared upstairs and we proceeded to get changed and go on stage. Now, after we come off the set and we uh, went into the dressing rooms and I got a towel and obviously I was sweating profusely. Uh, Jimmy said, nice one, man. And he passed me this trumpet-like implement he had in his hand, but not made of brass, not made of metal, made of paper. And his exact word, words to me was, hey man, put your lips round this baby. And it was what I later found out to be a 16 skin spliff. To which I had a couple of inhales, nearly bloody choked myself and passed it back. And uh, they proceeded to go on stage and I remember him saying uh, they were going to kick off with the song that was currently in the charts. Uh, and uh, he hoped that the, uh, the, the audience liked it. And this one was called Here Joe. Well, the rest was bloody history, wasn't it? Because uh, when he got back down to London, uh, his popularity increased and it just, well, the rest just bloody history, isn't it? Well, they came up and instead of traipsing all the way up to the bloody top floor, they found it more convenient to come and mix with us boys in the bloody pump room, which they did do. And... Uh, uh, passed Jimmy my towel, which was a little bit sweat stained, but he thanked me for that. And I said, Wow, what a sound, man, what a sound. I'd never heard out like it. I hadn't even seen him the previous week on top of the pops. But there you go. But the venue was packed. They had about 200 in, which was packed at capacity. Now, as we sort of sorted ourselves out, uh, sort of had a drink and relaxed after the gig. The roadies started uh, to uh, put the gear back in the vans and that. And sadly for Jimmy, luckily he had two guitars with him. A white one, which he brought from the States, and a black one. Both Fender Stratocasters. Stringed up the wrong way because he was a right hand player. And during the absence of anyone outside loading the vans, someone nicked Jimmy's black guitar. And it's been well publicised what happened to it. Some bloody clown stated that uh, he'd actually uh, had a jam with Jimmy on stage after the gig, which is a complete load of <laughs> nonsense. Uh, Jimmy was in no bloody state to be jamming with anyone. He was more concerned about his missing guitar. Luckily, it wasn't his white one, which was uh, the one he normally played with. But he had a lot of guitars because part of his act, not that night, uh, in big venues, I think Woodstock. In a couple of years' time, he played Woodstock. And he had a habit 
of uh, setting fire to the guitar. Uh, I think Pete Townsend, he was into that sort of stuff. Well, the Who were, weren't they? Look at Keith Moon. You know, my in uh, induction to meeting uh, Keith Moon in 1969. Uh, he was demolishing every bloody kit he could get his hands on, nearly. But there you go. That's my story. That's all I can say about it. Now, the next vlog I'm going to do after this one comes out, give me a little bit of uh, time. I'm going to talk about a band I was rodeoing for at the time called Ten Years After. And we played a venue again at Darlington, but a couple of years later uh, at the Civic Theatre. And supporting us was a very young band just on the way up, starting to uh, get somewhere from Birmingham and the name of this band was Black Sabbath so I'll tell you very shortly my involvement with Ozzy Osbourne and the rest of the boys but remember they were very young and at the very early stages now then going forward a message to Boris Johnson I'm very sorry the state of affairs you're in at the moment, uh, Boris. But if you had these people that's going to follow on a video, you would have been in a better place. This is all about sticking together and rocking in the real world. Okay, folks, thanks for watching. Two.